Today we're going to be making our glossary of painting for watercolor. A glossary is something that is usually the first assignment in a lot of my classes because it's a really great way to start off knowing a lot of the jargon and the basics of how you would approach any art artistic process. If you have this library of tools and you have the vocabulary to refer to it, you're going to be in a much better place. So uh, without further ado, let's get started. Before I get started on this project, I draw out a couple of thumbnails. This helps me to figure out some ideas that I can work off of. And if it only takes 30 seconds to draw a thumbnail of what the idea is, that's going to pay off in the fact that I won't end up having giant errors or commit to an idea that I turn out to not like, which might take hours to do. But if I can see that I don't like it, or maybe I have a better idea in a 30 second thumbnail, that really helps. These are just messing around with different space layouts. I try some other ideas, like what if there were like a uh, series of towers that each have ideas on them? What if I rendered a little scene of a painting and labeled stuff physically in use? Uh, I ended up uh, not choosing any of these, but it was definitely something that you should always do beforehand. It's something where if you want a client or a friend to participate, it lets you figure out the idea that you're committing to early. Next, I start working on different levels of paint consistency. I label these water, tea, coffee, milk, cream, and butter for the ratio of water and paint and what sort of liquid that's going to resemble. I actually put water down first in the water and tea areas because this is going to end up being a wet wash that uh, really you can think of it like, you know, um, just a little bit of tea in a teacup left over. It's going to be so light and thin that it's mostly water. I add a little bit of pigment as I go. And in the later ones, starting around milk, I actually start on dry paper, but with enough water to paper ratio that it goes on pretty quick. Uh, when I get to cream, it ends up being quite, quite thick. And for the last one, butter, I'm actually going for something that's so thick that you end up getting an impasto. Notice that broken up stroke when I put it down. This is gonna be great for things like texture. Whereas something like cream or lighter, it's oftentimes great for building up value slowly. You might do one coat of wash at a time to go all the way from water to cream. Next, I start working on a color wheel. I've done so many color wheels that I always try to make something new and different, just so that it's vaguely interesting still. I start with yellow because yellow is going to be the weakest color. And as I add any other color, it's going to be in a ratio of like, 10% other color, 90% yellow. And as I work, that's going to consistently be the case. So as I work, just a tiny amount of red and a little bit of yellow makes a decent orange. But I also try a little bit of the pigment. Yellow, red, and blue are your primaries. And the secondary colors mixed in between them are orange, purple, and green. I think I got the order wrong here, but you know, it still looks like a gradient. It just goes in reverse. And I'm trying to make these gradient towards white in the middle. So I'm adding extra water in the middle and trying to show how I can mix that slowly. For the different brush types, I start with a little diagram of what the different brush components are. Tip, head, belly, ferrule, crimp, handle, and size. I then draw different brush heads so that I can show what they look like when I use a stroke. And I get them in order first. The round is really good for drawing with a tiny point that has a lot of pigment at the end or by having a lot of water for washes and uh, blending. The filbert or a cat's tongue is kind of similar, but it's actually nicer for pushing all the paint to a hard edge. The flat is probably my favorite brush. You can actually tap it for little marks or you can draw it for big fills or a textured stroke. The angled brush I actually don't have, so I just fake it with my flat brush. The Sumie brush does the same thing as the round. It gets a lot of pigment gathered at the tip so you can draw with a fine point or have lots of water for things like three ink technique. The fan brush has a lot of texture. You can do interesting strokes. You can stipple with it. And it's actually great for blending two, uh, two colors together. The rigger brush tends to have very fine lines that can last for a very long time because of the water stored in it. Use it slow so that you end up having enough time for it. And then the water pen has a water reservoir that you can keep going back to.
I try out a couple of different brush strokes. Stuff like uh, washes and wet into wet are things where sometimes I'll start with the paper wet, and I mostly just want to show things like how they end up blending together. Whereas in other cases, if I have a certain paint load, I will come to a full block. If I get even more dry brushy, I can start getting interesting effects with my flat brush or with my fan. The Sumier brush I mess around with to show three ink technique, which is when you have a lot of pigment at the tip, no pigment at the belly of the brush, and therefore you can draw with it and get a gradient edge. I also use the rigor brush for things like uh, drawing. You can end up having a light load with uh, a little bit of paint and a lot of water, and it'll last a long time if you want to try drawing stuff. And then I apply several washes on top of each other to build it up. Of course, a lot of this is experimental, and messing around on a sheet like this is one of the best ways to find new ways to get interesting effects with your brushes. For experimental techniques, I try out all the things that are not brush specific. So for instance, lifting with a paper towel. If you put a wash down and put salt on things, the salt will suck up the water and you get interesting patterns in the pigment. The sponge is just practically another tool. Sometimes you can use it for texture, but you can also use it for lifts really well. I keep Q-tips in my kit for things like small areas of blending, and then oftentimes it's a great disposable brush that you can do interesting effects with. A credit card is very similar. Uh, it's always in your pocket if you're out painting in the wild. As for splatter, I end up pulling the bristles back to get different splatter effects on it. Grand Resist will make your pigment not stick to the paper. And putting tape down is a great way to affect where the paint is. This is great for things like uh, architectural things or a horizon, anything where you need things, or just putting around the edge of your canvas so you have a really nice clean border when you're done. And I do a little lift so you can still see the word tape. Watercolor pencils are another great way to do watercolor. You can draw with them just like a regular color pencil, but you can also draw with them wet or uh, use water afterwards to blend them. So after completing all these little glossary pictures, these little thumbnails, I then cut them out and I started arranging them on, this is actually a chalkboard, and uh, I just moved around until it was a layout that I liked and then I used a little chalk to mess around with it. I don't think I've ever made a class glossary the same way twice. It's a lot of fun to try and uh, make up something creative, some sort of innovative or interesting way to display the uh, information. So whenever you have something like this, uh, try and make it, you know, a visually interesting layout. And I hope you had fun. And I hope you learned something.